This is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over pressure injuries, formerly called pressure ulcers. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the integumentary system. And as always, at the end of this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Pressure injuries have had various names over the last several years. In the past, we have called them pressure ulcers, decubitus ulcers, or bed sores. And right now, they're most commonly termed as pressure injuries. So what are they? They are the breakdown of skin integrity due to some type of unrelieved pressure. And this can be from a bony area on the body coming into contact with an external surface, which leads to a pressure ulcer. And here in a moment, we're going to go over all those common sites of those bony sites that can lead to a pressure injury. Also, some type of medical device can cause this or friction and shear, which we're going to talk about in depth here in a moment. So now let's talk about how a pressure injury happens. Okay, to do that, we first need to review the basic layers of the skin. So we have the epidermis on the top, then below that we have the dermis. And then right below the dermis, we have the capillary bed, which feeds and perfuses and supplies our dermis and epidermis. So remember that. And then below that, we have our fatty subcutaneous tissue followed by muscle and then bone. Okay, so we have a patient and let's say they've been sitting in the chair for a really long time. Okay, so when a patient's sitting in a chair, what bony prominence is going to put them at risk for developing a pressure injury, that coccyx bone. So what happens, say they've been in the chair way too long, that coccyx bone is exerting pressure this way on those bottom layers. Then you have the external hard surface, that chair where the patient's sitting, and it's exerting its pressure down this way. Now what's in the middle? We have pressure coming this way and that way. We have our blood supply, which have two pressures coming together, two layers pushing together, it's going to pinch off that blood supply to that skin, the epidermis and dermis, which is going to lead to what? A pressure injury. So we have various stages of pressure injury. It goes from stage one to stage four, and we're going to go over those here in a moment. I'm going to give you examples. And whenever we are looking at pressure injuries, we're looking at the depth of how much this injury has been affected. For instance, does the injury extend down into where you can see the subcutaneous tissue, which would be like a stage three, or does it even go as far where you can actually see the muscle, the tendon, the ligament, and the bone, which is a stage four? Or it can be where the top layer of the skin is completely intact, but it's really red, and when you press on it, it doesn't blanch, so it doesn't turn white, and that would be a stage one. Now let's talk about friction and shear for a moment. Okay, what is this? Because as a nurse, when we get into our nursing interventions, we really want to make sure we're not doing activities that cause this, because that can cause a pressure injury. So what this is, it's where you have the bone right here, the bottom layer moving in the opposite direction of the skin. So how can this happen? Big common way this can happen is if your patient's sitting in bed and they're sliding down in the bed. So what happens is that, we'll say the coccyx again, is moving this way. And as they slide down the bed, the skin is moving this way. So when you have these two forces going opposite direction, what's gonna to happen to that middle layer that's so important that perfuses our dermis and epidermis? It's going to tear, it's going to mess up. Then we get decreased perfusion, which makes a great site for a pressure injury. Now let's talk about risk factors that can increase a patient's risk of developing a pressure injury. And I would really remember these risk factors because exams love to throw out all these patients that could have a potential risk for a pressure injury and you need to select the one that has the most risk. Okay, so whenever you're looking at those options or you're thinking about this, try to think about it this way. Okay, think of the patient population that can't relieve their own self-pressure, like they can't shift their weight in bed 
or they have decreased sensory perception, which would lead to them not really being able to shift their own weight, or they've had some type of injury that prevents them from doing that. They have some type of medical device they're wearing, like the splint, the nasal cannula. Really with the nasal cannulas, I have seen where they have wore pressure injuries on the ear, so you have to watch out for that or they have decreased skin integrity. So poor nutrition is definitely a huge risk for developing a pressure injury. So look out for those low weights, low body mass indexes because that decreases our skin integrity. If the patient is immobile, they're just not getting out of bed, they can't move, they can't get up and walk, they're confined to that bed, which requires you to turn them every two hours, they're definitely at risk. They have some type of neuro issue where they have decreased level of consciousness. This could be because they're sedated. We're in a sense causing their decreased level of consciousness because we're treating them for something else. Or they have, their labs are thrown off, or they're just not aware of where they're at, or they have some type of spinal injury, maybe quadriplegic, something like that where they can't actually feel that pressure and shift their own weight. Diabetics are at risk for this, so if they are immobile, have neuro issues, poor nutrition, really huge candidate for a pressure ulcer because why is that? Well, diabetics, we know that they have decreased perception of sensory. So patients who don't have diabetes, they can feel, you know, if they step on something with their feet more than a person who has diabetes, they may not know that they've injured their foot and they have decreased perfusion. So their epidermis and dermis isn't going to be as perfuse as well as someone who doesn't have diabetes. A patient who is incontinent, this can be of stool or urine if that sets on the skin long, they have that pressure building that increases the risk of a pressure injury and activities that cause that friction and shear that we just talked about. So preventing your patient from sliding down in the bed and when you do have to move your patient up in bed because a lot of times patients are they get down in the bed instead of dragging them up in the bed lifting them and moving them instead of making it where you would drag them because again the bone's going to move in another direction the top layer of the skin is going to move in the other you're going to tear your capillary bed and increase the risk of a pressure injury now let's talk about the top sites for pressure injury and whenever you are a nurse you're taking care of your patient you want to be aware of what position the patient's in and where those bony prominences are at so you can be thinking of okay i want to make sure that they're not having pressure injuries at these locations and these locations include the heels and the ankles, as well as the hips, the sacral area on the back, the elbows and shoulders, the inside of the knees, along with the occipital area and the ears. Now let's take a little quiz. Okay, we have this patient, they're laying on their left side, so where do you think they're gonna be at most risk for a pressure injury? So whenever we look at this, we need to think, okay, what areas are going to be either coming into contact with the hard surface, that bony prominence, or are they gonna be two bony prominences coming together? Because that can also lead to a pressure injury as well. Okay, we'll start from, start from head to toe and work our way down. So the ear, definitely, because laying right there, that's a perfect area for a pressure injury. Next, move down our shoulder. Hard bony area on your shoulder right there can lead to one. And then as we move down our hips, big bony area that's just a perfect site for a pressure injury. The knees, whenever you're laying in this position, not only with the knee coming into contact with the surface, but the two knees actually coming together can cause that, along with the ankles, which is another site. So the ankles coming together or the ankle laying on the bed. So it would be good to get this patient like a wedge pillow to help prevent that from happening. Now let's talk about staging of pressure injuries. And these stages are based on the National Pressure Injury Staging System. Okay, stage one. This is where the skin is completely intact. So that top layer is not going to be broken. And this area is going to be very red, but the key with stage one that you need to remember is that it doesn't blanch. So if you touched on this red area, it would not turn white, it would stay the same color. 
And here is an example of a stage one. If you pressed here on the heel where it's extremely red, it would not blanch. Next, stage two. This is where the skin is visibly damaged. It's not going to be intact. And you are going to see partial loss of the dermis. So it extends down to the dermis, but it will not extend down into the sub -Q fatty tissue. That will not be visible. And it can have a wound that can be a superficial red or pink open ulcer, or it may have a formation of an open or closed blister. And here's an example of what a stage two looks like. Next is stage three. This is where the skin is visibly damaged and not intact with full loss of skin tissue. Now you may see the sub -Q fatty tissue, which will be yellowish or white in that wound bed. And the wound edges can be rolled away, like called epibol. Now the big thing about this is that you are not going to see bone, tendon, muscle, ligament that will not be visible. And here is an example of a stage three. And notice at the top that the wound edges have began to roll away. And one of the most severe stages of a pressure injury is a stage four. This is where the skin is visibly damaged, of course, and there is also full loss of skin tissue. But the thing is, is that it will expose bone, muscle, tendon, and ligaments. You will be able to see this. And here is an example of a stage four pressure injury. And as you can see, you can see the bone very clearly in this image. Now let's look at an unstageable pressure injury. Okay, the reason it's unstageable, you can't actually stage it as a one, two, three, or four, is because there's slough or eschar covering a full thickness ulcer. And slough is yellowish tan substance, and you can see that here in this picture, and eschar is like a brownish black area covering the wound. So because that's in the way, you can't actually see the depth of the wound, so it's labeled unstageable. And lastly, let's look at a deep tissue injury. Okay, this presents as a purplish or blackish area over the skin that is intact. And the fatty tissue is injured below. And you may also see where there's been like this blackish, full looking blistered area. I've seen this on the heels. And when you um, touch this, palpate it, it will feel heavy and spongy. And this is a deep tissue injury. Now let's talk about nursing interventions. What are we gonna do for this patient who has a pressure injury? Okay, our role includes prevention, detection, and wound care. So what we're gonna be doing is whenever we receive a patient, whenever we go in to do that head to toe assessment, we are going to really concentrate on that skin integrity and making sure that they have no pressure injuries already there. And if they do, we immediately want to document that. And we want to include the stage of the pressure injury, the size, the color, the drainage. Also, notify the physician if it's a really bad wound that could be cultured. You want to notify them about that so you can possibly obtain a order for a wound culture. Also, if the wound is very severe, you may need an order to contact the wound care team so they can come assess that wound and prescribe treatment. Another thing is every shift you're going to be assessing the patient's risk factors for a potential pressure injury. And in the hospital, with every shift, when we document, we use the Braden scale. And the Braden scale looks at six categories. It looks at sensory, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, and friction and shear, which is what we really talked about at the beginning of the lecture with those risk factors. So we're looking at all those, and based on what they score, it can go from zero to 23, with a nine or less being a very high risk risk and 19 to 23 there's really no risk at all now in our plan of care what we want to include are things that will help us prevent any further breakdown of a pressure injury that is already there or to help prevent one altogether so some things we can include as keeping the skin dry and clean. The patient's incontinent, you want, or excessively sweaty, you wanna use barrier creams to help protect that skin, especially where a pressure injury can develop. Make sure they always are wearing a clean gown, dry linens, and preferably 
wrinkle free. Also turn them every two hours. That's the minimum. We want to make sure that if they can't alleviate their own pressure on those bony prominences that we are helping them do that. Watch for those activities that produce friction and shear. And we talked about that earlier in the lecture. And one thing with the patients who really slide down in the bed, what can help is as you put the head of the bed up, put their foot of the bed up a little bit. So they're not gonna just be sliding down. Instead, when you have the foot up a little bit, that will help prevent them sliding down. And another thing is that you can get your patient special devices, like there are air beds made for patients who are at risk for pressure injuries. If they are just at a huge risk, they score really low on the Braden scale, you can get them beds that will cycle on and off with these air pockets that will help alleviate the pressure on those bony prominences. Also, you can get patients heel boots to help prevent those heels from just setting on the bed, elbow pads, as well as wedges to keep those knees and ankles separated, gel cushions for the bottom if they sit in the bedside chair a lot or they sit up in bed or they're in the wheelchair, that can help prevent pressure injuries developing there. Some other things include to routinely assess the skin integrity around those medical devices, especially with the nasal cannula, any type of mask they're wearing, or if they have splints like our ortho devices, it can really put pressure on the skin and lead to a pressure injury. So make sure you're always assessing that. Also, the physician may order to consult nutrition or you can recommend that, especially if your patient has poor nutrition and it's going to alter the way that their wound is going to heal. So they can prescribe high caloric diets with all those nutrients needed to promote wound healing. Also, a lot of times whenever the pressure injury is very severe, they will consult wound care, which will come in, look at the wound, prescribe treatment, and as the nurse, you will need to follow that out based on their regimen that they listed. And there's various treatments for pressure injuries. It depends on the stage and the severity and what's going on. Some things include wound vax, debridement, special dressings that will promote the wound healing and that wound base, and a neat treatment called hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and this is where they deliver high amounts of oxygen to that wound to help promote healing. Okay, so that wraps up this review over pressure injuries. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.